सजेशन इज दैट बिफोर गोइंग आर डूइंग एनी सर्जरी जस्ट नो हाउ टू हैंडल द इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स इन ऑप्थेलमोलॉजी इफ यू नो हाउ टू हैंडल ए इंस्ट्रूमेंट देन यूर सर्जरी इज आई एम टेलिंग यू विथ माई एक्सपीरियंस इट विल बी फिफ्टी परसेंट लेस कॉम्प्लिकेटेड एज कम्पेयर टू वेन यू आर नॉट होल्डिंग सो फर्स्ट एट लीस्ट वेन यू आर गोइंग टू डू सर्जरी आर गोइंग टू असिस्ट सर्जरी एट लीस्ट वॉच वन आर टू वीडियोज देर आर लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स अवेलेबल रीड समथिंग बिकॉज अंटिल अनलेस यूर माइंड नोज यू कैन नॉट सी वॉट इज गोइंग थेयर एंड अनदर थिंग इफ वेट लैब एंड अदर थिंग्स आर पॉसिबल देन डू इट आर गो फॉर इट लाइक इन आई वेस वी आर रनिंग सर्जिकल स्किल ट्रांसफर कोर्सेज इन ऑल द स्टेट कॉन्फ्रेंसेज नाउ इट इज वेट लैब इज ए मैंडेटरी पार्ट एंड एज पर एन एम सी इट इज ऑल्सो ए मैंडेटरी सो मोस्ट ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूशन हैव सम स्मॉल वेट लैब एरिया इन देयर थर्ड वन इज द पोजिशनिंग वॉट इवर यू आर गोइंग एंड वॉट इंस्ट्रूमेंट यू आर गोइंग जस्ट चेक इट बिफोर यूजिंग इफ यू आर यूजिंग एनी विस्को कैनुला और एनी थिंग वेदर इट इज लॉक्ड और फ्रीली ओपन इफ यू आर यूजिंग एनी योर टिप देन फर्स्ट सी वेदर इट इज ब्लंट समटाइम्स यू विल फाइंड इट डजेंट मीन्स दैट इट इज फ्रेश मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स देयर इज अ थॉट दैट वी हैव ओपन एवरी थिंग न्यू न्यू डजेंट मीन्स डैट इट इज हंड्रेड परसेंट परफेक्ट ऑल दो इट इज नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट परफेक्ट बट इफ वी डोंट नो वन परसेंट वॉट हैपन्स एंड अगेन इंस्ट्रूमेंट होल्डिंग ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स द डायरेक्शन लाइक हेयर यू हैव सीन सम वन इज इंजेक्टिंग विस्को हॉर्जोंटली इट इज इट स्लाइटली मोर ट्रबल सम टू इंसर्ट और इंजेक्ट द हाई विस्कॉस्टी थिंग्स अगेंस्ट द ग्रेविटी इफ यू यूज यूर सीरेंज टिप जस्ट बॉटम देन यू विल फाइंड आउट हाउ ईजी इट विल बी टू गो देयर एंड अगेन फॉर मेकिंग फ्लैप आर एनी थिंग वेन यू आर गोइंग फॉर योर कॉर्नियल एंड अदर थिंग देन एट लीस्ट सी विच एरिया यू आर सींग एंड वॉट इज द एरिया यू आर गोइंग टू कवर एंड होल्डिंग वन ऑफ द सर्जरी ऑल दो वी आर गिविंग ब्लॉक बट स्टिल वी नीड सपोर्ट फॉर द अनदर थिंग सो होल्डिंग ऑफ इंस्ट्रूमेंट मीन्स दीज फोर फाइव थिंग्स रिगार्डिंग द ब्रिडल सूचर वी ऑल नो नाउ इट इज फ्यू पीपल आर वेरियस मार्कर्स आर देयर ग्लोब स्टेबलाइजर्स आर देयर दो स्टेबलाइजर्स द ग्लोब टू फिक्स इट बट इफ यू आर यूजिंग ए ब्रिडल सूचर देन टेक केयर ऑफ दैट देयर मे बी चांस दैट इट मे बी इनिशियल डेज वेन यू आर होल्डिंग इट इट गोज पार्सियल इट गोज इनकम्प्लीट कंजेक्टाइबल वॉज देयर बट डजेंट अफ्रेड ऑफ दैट मनली थिंग विच इज रियली कंसर्न इज डोंट गो सो डीप दैट यू परफ्रेट समथिंग आर डोंट क्रैप सो टाइटली दैट यू पुल आउट द सुपीरियर एक्टस मसल इफ इट इज कंजेक्टाइबल आर पार्शियल इट्स ओके आई एम टेलिंग इट हैपन्स विथ ऑल ऑफ अस हु हैड डिड एनी ऑफ द कंट्रैक्ट सर्जरी नो वन कैन डिनाई दैट ही जम्ड एंड क्लैम्प्ड द सुपीरियर एक्टस इन वन वे and every time correctly so it's a common mistake or not a common mistake it's just a learning cycle so for everyone go slowly don't be afraid of this step flap and cotti yes nowadays there is lot of school of thought different school of thought that whether we do flap and cotti or not but again flap and cotti is important although it if it is more than there is chances of dryness or other thing but whenever you are doing any flap or cotti just know the ideal exposure size that you have to do it before the blue zone means don't go towards the corneal side and again if it is possible and if you have cut the flap in which tenons is left then there is chances that at the time of cotti it will lead to lot of black spots or the tenon hydration so for the smooth movement of the tunnel bed everything you have to be perfect i am skipping this slide because it doesn't have much points but one thing is that cauterization without proper tenons fascia may have some inefficient cauterization other thing but one thing is that if you are using this type of cautery means wet field cautery then make sure that water is someone your assistant sometimes is spreading lot of waters it is not cut it's just a drop of water or just like because you have to go our cautery tip is like that don't close it if it is like that then the current flows between in this right to left left to right and that will help in the cautery and the cauterization don't go by the closing it 
टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन यस टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन इज इम्पॉर्टेंट बिकॉज टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन हैविंग टू थ्री मेजर सिग्निफिकेंस वन ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर द टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन इज यू हैव टू नो द एग्जैक्ट डेफ्थ ऑफ द टनल वट आर द टिप्स टू नो द एग्जैक्ट डेफ्थ एंड अनदर थिंग इज बिकॉज ऑफ दिस टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन होल एस्टिकमेटिजम यू विल मैनेज विथ योर सर्जरी सो सम डूज एंड सम डोंट्स फॉर द टनल कंस्ट्रक्शन इफ यू हैव सीन दैट योर नाइफ If you are going by that and your knife is clearly visible, clearly visible means you are looking just it is just like a transparent and hundred. It is more superficial means you are going to do a button holing or it will be a superficial. So for that, if you started tunnel like this one from this point and if you find out here something uh, superficial, don't be afraid. Again, you can make tunnel from the another side from the center, superficial but. important thing is don't make whole tunnel superficial or deep at least go to one place and check whether it is superficial or deep and same if it is a premature entry or you have directly enter so deep again check it so my tip for that is apart from these all things you have to go just make that insert your needle tip and press it once you press it you will find a dimple here the place where you are putting it so this dimpling in the cornea in the middle of the cornea gives you the idea that yes you are in the middle if you are deep then you will directly go into the anterior chamber so you can judge so anything you have to check either superficial or deep at the starting don't complete the tunnel then check whether you are superficial or deep it will create a lot of problem and finally you have to stitch it these are the various size uh, sides and type of incision which manage the astigmatism you can learn it gradually and gradually but only previously initially people start from straight incision some from the curved some is smiley some anti smiley frown all these techniques have their own advantages and disadvantages but yes if you go for the frown or the severan incision then but obviously astigmatism is let but it requires slightly more learning curve side port management is still i am saying a, it looks like very simple but it is a problematic one thing important is have a good size of the side port how you will determine so best of the th thing is that when you are going go complete whatever your side port direction is there go to this complete width and at the time of coming outside slightly increase it just half of that area you enter and comes out that gives you an idea that yes you are good because if it is a small side port you cannot inject even your uh, visco another problem and lot of the things happens just because of the smaller side port most of the time the detachment detachment at the area of side port or these things will happen because of this so side port size is important site is also important because if you are in this plane between 8 to 10 it will be easy for you to inject each and every maneuver and again i am saying go for my this tip always inspect your blade before most of the time to after two three surgery or sometimes sisters or your colleague wash it and it becomes blunt and you keep on pressing on the side port okay anterior chamber opening yes we all know it requires tips initially we go for the uh, capsulotomy or the triple c whatever you are planning but one thing i suggest for the beginner is give some more time for the staining of the anterior capsule if it if you giving more staining means like this type of stain you are seeing the whole capsule is well stained then it will be much easier for you to either do the capsulotomy or the capsulotomy or the capsular axis whatever is there but initially more staining will help you so at least go for the slightly more staining nucleus management yes there are the different options all these are the options what you have to go and what you have to not go means what are the different various methods either visco expression phaco fracture or whatever you can do but one thing is important that when you are going don't Uh, for the re removal of any nucleus one of the important thing is your lip so at the time of removal of the nucleus try to slightly press your scleral lip down what happens most of the time we are 
going in this direction and our scleral lip is up so if we are getting anything a nucleus from the up direction without pressing the sclera then it will what happens it will again lock our wound and the nucleus will not deliver and most of the time it hang up so slightly pressing of the lower sclera at the time of delivery will help you a lot in that cortical wash we all know either you use any technique but one of the important thing is for those are there if suppose cortex is there then usually pull it against almost 180 degree to opposite side so that it will be a much easier for there to skip out so wound closure whatever the wound closure is the possible or further things it is very much important to check it will not it will not only help you in the proper uh, sealing but also help you to prevent the infections so check your wound first of all whatever suppose this is the area best technique is use your dry cotton here and there and then remove it and see whether this dry cotton will be getting wet or not just one minute more or it is the again becomes wet one of the thing is the important side port closure by the adequate hydration is important most of the time at the beginning you just remove uh, this and don't forget to do the hydro for the side port and some of the experts also recommend whatever you have did the flap cautery again reposit it and either you inject some injections and fluids beside, beside the con in the your flap portion so that it comes outside or most of the them in experts suggest that do a mild cautery of the this uh, dissected flap and the remaining of the conjunctiva so it will close automatically but any point I am again saying don't be afraid of sutures. These are our real friends who helped us in each and every situation. Dr. Mamta just so, showed us the beauty of the sutures, how they change the life. Same is for the SICS. In any step you find your wound is leaky or tunnel is uh, uh, having a premature depth or the deeper, don't afraid of the sutures. Do it. Even if side port is uh, bulky or the leaky, then you can do the side port suturing too. Sutures are for our help. No, most of the time, youngsters thought that uh, in my case, we have to put three suture, four suture, then it will be something wrong happened or anything. No. Sutures are our friend. Be friendly with them and do it. Any point of time, having a leaky wound is more dangerous than having one suture extra. With this, some important tips. The take home message is always have some time, means devote some time from instrument handling to these steps. Don't jump like my teacher is doing in two minutes, so I will do in two minutes. It is not a one time game, it requires long learning curve and other thing. And most important is that you have to manage not only this one, but the astigmatism, corneal edema, and the post operative vision all these parameters you can manage if you manage each one of the step take each one of the step as a different and difficult step that's why you can go with these words thank you everyone thank you, thank you very much dr deepak thank you for that insightful talk our next speaker is dr pranita shahai she is the assistant professor gnec maulana azad medical college and her topic of presentation is amniotic membrane grafting, my initial experiences. Good morning, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank AIS for this opportunity and Dr. Deepak sir for including me as a co-instructor in his instruction course. So, uh, ma'am, thank you for the introduction. I'll be talking about amniotic membrane grafting. So, when the name of amniotic membrane graft comes, everybody thinks that this is something pertaining only to cornea specialist. But here I am to tell you that amniotic membrane grafting is a very simple procedure. If you know the basics of when, where and how to do it, it is something that should be done by practice by everybody. Not a difficult task that you need to refer a patient to a cornea specialist for this procedure. If you know about the dealers who provide AMG in your or city or state and you know how the, uh, to deal with this technique. It is something that can be done even by general ophthalmologist or ophthalmologist practicing other speciality. So basically amniotic membrane as we all know consists of three layers. It has an epithelium, basement membrane and stroma. 
the basement membrane contains certain growth factors which promotes the epithelization process it also has certain cytokines which has anti fibrotic and anti inflammatory effect now the procurement processing is uh, is uh, common to all the procedure uh, all the types of amg whether you are using a fresh a cryo preserved or a dry amg uh the fresh amgs are prepared obtained from donors undergoing cesarean section after obtaining a negative serology that is hiv hepatitis hdlv and syphilis the placenta is cleaned under sterile conditions with bss the amnion is separated from chorion and the amniotic membrane is then cut into pieces and placed on a nitrocellulose paper don't worry this is not the task of an ophthalmologist this is done in the gynae department by trained staff but yes obtaining a fresh amg is something that can only be done in an institutional practice if we are looking at private practice or small setup practice fresh amg is something which is not available in such situation you get cryo preserved amgs or dry amgs so the cryo preserved amg again comes in two forms you can get one with a vial wherein you get amg in the form of a sheet or you can get procura which is a ring form a ring with in which the amg is embedded okay so these these ring form of amgs which are procura amgs do not require any assembly you can directly apply it like a contact lens on the patient's eye while the cryo preserved amg which comes as sheets need to be applied either with the help of a fibrin glue or with the help of vicral sutures that we'll see in the subsequent videos now dry amg comes like this in boxes it is like a cellophane paper and as soon as you dip it in water or normal saline it becomes very soft and friable just like a fresh amg and it retains most of the physical biological and morphological properties as that of a fresh amg except for the fact that the growth factors are limited in the dry amg now we have already seen that it promotes amgs promote epithelialization it has growth factors anti angiogenic anti microbial anti fibrotic factors and it also acts like a mechanical barrier protects the cornea from inflammatory mediators or any external agent which is constantly rubbing in the cornea for example cases of vkc wherein there are giant papillae so there are various surgical techniques you can have an inlay or a graft technique wherein you can see here uh that in case you have a neurotrophic ulcer or a shield ulcer in the area where you have a corneal ulcer you can use it as a small patch graft you can have an overlay or a patch technique wherein you can place the entire sheet of amg over and above your surface ocular surface you can even use a combination of these two techniques wherein you can do an inlay and overlay all together now it is also important to understand the orientation of amg normally the amg comes on the nitrocellulose blotting paper the epithelium side is up and towards the nitrocellulose paper is the side of the stroma so based on the technique that you are following you may also want to know whether you are putting it epithelium up or epithelium down so how to identify that one is the nitrocellulose blotting paper orientation the surface which is not in contact with the paper is epithelium up the top part is epithelium up and the other way once you detach it from the paper sometimes it gets messed up it rolls up and then you need to again identify which is the epithelium so what you can do is just take a swab stick of a cotton or a uh, merosil sponge touch the uh, amg if it is sticking sticking to the sponge if it is getting lifted up or tented up that means it is stroma so what we remember is is s for s stroma is sticky it gets stuck to your merosil sponge now coming to the indications it can be used either for the conjunctival surface reconstruction or for the corneal surface reconstruction in the conjunctival surface which is common practice that everybody does is pterygium surgery in case you have a large pterygium pseudo pterygium or a recurrent pterygium in those cases you can obviously use amg as a replacement in contrast to your conjunctival autograph in addition you may also find in your practice patients of chemical burns sgs coming to you in all cases of chemical burns that are grade 3 grade 4 or acute sgs with corneal involvement if you do an immediate amg it is life saving and sight saving for these patients rather than wasting time and sending these patients to a corneal specialist you can yourself do an amg in your setup in corneal surface procedures uh, where in neurotrophic ulcers uh, where you have partial lcd you want to do a slit or a clet in those cases also amg is useful sometimes you do dermoid surgery is lipodermoid and a mass excision or a ocular surface squamous neoplasia in such cases when you are creating a conjunctival defect 
you want to close these areas with a graft conjunctival autograft is one option but if your size is too big amg is a good replacement in such places which you can easily obtain in leaking blebs also some glaucoma surgeons use it so let's see a surgical video this was a case of pseudo pterygium excision with amg so this patient had a history of chemical injury and ended up ended up with a pseudo pterygium here we can see that the limbus was first marked and uh, the pseudo pterygium is being excised with the help of a crescent blade since the center of the cornea was not involved i did not plan this patient for a slit and decided to go first for a simple uh, excision of this pseudo pterygium with an amg it is very important that once you remove such mass you cauterize all the bleeders very well because these bleeders tend to form a sub uh, amg hematoma that can lead to infections so cauterize all the bleeders you can see this is the nitrocellulose blotting paper i am uh, uh, removing the amg from the blotting paper and putting it up on the corneal surface i am putting it up epithelium down now here the stroma is up there is uh, no general consensus different surgeons uh, propagate different things uh, you can have either epithelium up or down and once you cut it and place it on the surface you can just apply a few drops of fibrin glue and spread it up gently to cover the entire area of epithelial defect you can even keep it a millimeter beyond it with fibrin glue it is always important that whatever is the residual or extra glue needs to be cut or trimmed or else it causes you know irritation and sometimes that can be a foreign body because of which the patient rubs and blinks too much and it can cause dislodgement of your amg as well so cut whatever is the extra amg or extra glue next this was a case of a chemical injury a young lady who presented with toilet cleaner um, acid injury and she as you can see in the picture the top is the baseline picture that the cornea although is looking clear on fluorescent stain you can see it there's a nearly 90% epithelial defect and nine clock hour of limbus is involved the conjunctiva is showing blanched out vessels it is a grade 5 uh, duas grade 5 uh, chemical injury in such case if you do an immediate amg and placement of a simblepharon ring and maybe a temporary tarsorophy for some time you can have you know gratifying results you can see if day 14 the amg starts to disintegrate day 21 again it is becoming uh, starting to disintegrate and by 3 to 4 weeks the amg completely dissolves and it has served the purpose given you the growth factors given the mechanical barrier and helped the epithelialization process without any signs of limbal stem cell deficiency which is a likely outcome if you don't treat chemical injuries in time now this is another patient a kid who presented with shield ulcer and it was recalcitrant to medical therapy so we decided to take the child in ga for shield ulcer debridement with amg application so here with the crescent the amg uh, the shield ulcer plaque is being debrided these are very thick needs to be sometimes peeled or removed with the help of crescent and on the top of it amg again is being put with the epithelium side down now in case if your ulcer is too deep and you think that the cornea is thinned out you can even do a multilayered amg in this case that is you put a small patch in the site of the ulcer and over and above that you put a full layer of amg covering the entire ocular surface which will protect it from the giant papillae rubbing on to the corneal surface and also help in the epithelialization now in this case we did not use a glue because the patient was not affording we had used the vicryl sutures which can be very well used now it is very important when you're doing a vicryl suture in amg that you take big bites big bold bites you need to hold the tenon and uh, tenon and conjunctiva well because what happens is if you take a small bite the amg is very thin and friable it will either cut through cheese wire and cause dislodgement or displacement of the amg in the early post op period so take a big bulk both of the amg conjunctiva and try and take the tenons also and uh, at least it should be 1 to 2 mm wide multiple interrupted sutures and avoid large conjunctival vessels because if you hit any major vessel it will lead to a large subcon hemorrhage and sub amg bleed which is very difficult to remove once your graft is in place this was a case of a 10 year old child who presented late onset who presented late with a chemical injury sequelae wherein amg was used for slit again another patient she presented with this mass lesion in the left eye temporal aspect suspected to be a lipodermoid and we removed the lipodermoid it was extensive and it was quite adherent to the conjunctiva despite of the best attempts to preserve the conjunctiva we ended up in having a large conjunctival defect 
and hence we closed it with a amniotic membrane graft large defect if you try and just close you know trying to oppose the conjunctiva you can have shortening of the fornix and limitation of extraocular movements as well so try and use you know replacement for a conjunctival defect which can be either an autograft or an amg now this was a case of ossn uh, wherein we remove we ha you have to do a large margin clearance obviously you end up having a large defect again amg was used for clearing it for closing this defect post operative management you just need a topical antibiotic for 2 to 3 weeks and a topical steroid for 6 to 8 weeks because in 4 to 6 weeks time your amg completely dissolves so you don't need steroids over and above that lubricant obviously you can give for comfort and over and above that based on the indication that you're treating you give on add on medications the complications that you can have is displacement and dislodgement of the amg is one of the most common complication at day day 3 or day 4 the patient comes to you you know almost 50% of the amg is coming out of the lid so uh, just proper suturing and proper placement is something which is essential and in case the amg is getting dislodged and you think it's a recent dislodgement you can even attempt a re-suturing of the I would, displaced I would amg i request you to please yes. wind up okay so and uh, other complications are hematoma and microbial infections so the take home uh, message is there are various clinical applications but the simple it's a simple surgical technique with low intraoperative and post operative complication and hence you can definitely use in your routine practice thank you thank you dr parinita that was a wonderful presentation and uh, next we have dr ravi ranjan so he is from patna and uh, he is going to talk about his initial days uh, or initial difficulties during uh, TCR surgery. Dr. Ravi Ranjan sir has uh, like many, many years of experience when it comes to oculoplasty and DCR and we very fondly call him the father of DCR, the local father of DCR if I, if I am correct, right sir? Thank you AIUS and Deepak and thanks Mamta for a nice introduction. Uh, my topic is initial problem faced during DCR surgery. Uh, no financial, uh, that DCR is the creation of low resistance pathway from the canariculi to the nose by means of creating an osteotomy of, osteotomy of the bone adjacent to the lacrimal sac and now uh, opening in the leisure lacrimal sac as you all know it can be performed by our external or endonasal approach. Uh, by personal communication with many ophthalmologists reveal that the failure of the procedure, hemorrhage and tedious flap making in DCR are the main cause of reluctance from the surgery. And as a result, nowadays DCR is ignored by many eye surgeons, particularly new eye surgeons. And uh, lacrimal surgery is increasingly being undertaken by ENT surgeons. And uh, in an era when other specialties are always looking to widen their surgical spectrum, uh, we are losing our domain by ignoring this and it is going in the hand of ENT surgeons now. Uh, first of all, I shall talk why DCR fails. And the cause, if you will do 100 DCR, approximately 40, more than 40 DCR has failed due to fibrous tissue growth in bony ostium. More than 10% because of collapse of breach between anterior flaps. More than 15% due to some syndromes. 18 and more percent due to inappropriate size of location of the, location of the bony ostium. That's come second after fibrous tissue growth at a bony ostium. And uh, common canaliculous obstruction in more than 10% cases and intact lacrimal sac in more than 4%. Uh, for a successful DCR surgery, one should know anatomy and appreciation of precise anatomy is essential to understand the process of DCR surgery. And uh, should I escape this because uh, everybody, and, and this is the lacrimal sac sits within the lacrimal fossa that bounds entirely by frontal process of maxillary bone and posteriorly by thin lacrimal bone. I am skipping all these, yeah, uh, pre-operative clinical examination is must for any Wigner and alternative cause of epiphora such as evaporative dry eye, reflex tearing, eyelid malposition, functal, uh, functal stenosis must be excluded at the time of examination, first examination of the patient and the eyelid should be examined for malposition and evidence of mevovian gland dysfunction and the punctum is inspected for size and location and specifically as to whether it is in the tear lake or not. Exam they examine for the absence of puncta and any fistula or accessory puncta especially so in all children. And the cornea should be examined for punctate epithelial staining, tear film quality, tear film breakup time, epithelial defects and infiltrate or keratitis. That means it is the other causes of uh, uh, tearing and we go for 
this ER surgery without any profit to the patient. And the fluorescein dye disappearance test should be evaluated and the nasolacrimal psych area should be inspected for presence of swelling or a mucosal. Very important point here, any swelling above. Medial canthal tendon is atypical and may represent malignancy of the psych mucosa or other pathology and this should be investigated with imaging prior to proceeding to the DCR. And digital pressure is applied to the psych area and punctum is observed for any mucoid reflex indicative of mucosal. During operation, nasal packing is the first step in my view and it, it is done to keep the mucosa taut and reduce bleeding and this should be explained to the patient. And anesthetic to the nostril with few drops of 4% topical lignocan, then nasal packing inserted in the ipsilateral nostril with the help of nasal packing forceps, crocodile forceps, yeah, is in the direction of medial palpebral ligament that is superior, then posterior, then inferior. Uh, anesthesia is always local anesthesia used in adult and in child for general anesthesia. Lignocanyl filtration, I prefer a single point block in DCR surgery and the preferred site of infiltration is upper inner angle of the orbits just medial to the medial canthus where MPL is situated. At the MPL insertion, the bone is hit with the 26 gauze needle and 2-3 cc is injected. Then the bevel of the uh, 26 gauze needle rotated superiorly, then 2-3 cc injected and then rotate inferiorly while injecting the remaining 2-3 cc. And firm pressure is applied for 5 to 10 minutes for the anesthetic to act. Cleaning is done with spirit and povidone right up to the upper lip. Uh, one thing is very important, patients should also be informed before and during the procedure that there will be a sound of bone cracking. Otherwise, the patient is horrified most of the time. Not unlike when a tooth is extracted and they may experience pain equal to or less than the associated with an IM injection. Just you have to console the patient it is not going to pain more than an IM injection. Incision is very, initial incision is very important. Mark the anterior lacrimal crest by filling patient's inferior orbital rim and then going up. J-shaped curvilinear, uh, curvilinear incision is taken 3 to 4 mm from MPL the, the for medial canthus starting 2 to 3 mm MPL about 1.5 to 2 centimeter in length and identification exposure of MPL is very important. These are the sac dissection. In sac dissection, I shall give posterior crust of MPL is not disturbed otherwise it may lead to Pump failure post-operatively and watering post-operatively. Bone ostium creation. Uh, extent of ostium. Anterior till the punch cannot be inserted between the bone and nasal mucosa. Posteriorly till removal of aerated ethamoid. Superiorly till 2 mm above the medial canthus. Inferiorly till the nasolacrimal canal is par partially derived. Fly formation. In flap formation, I shall highlight using the probe as a guide, incision is made with the help of number of, number 11 or 15 blade right across the sac from the fundus to the nasal lacrimal duct. Flaps are raised and the posterior one is cut. Uh, in case of overriding nasal mucosa overriding the, during flap anastomosis, in case of overriding nasal mucosal overriding is preferable or alternatively one can tend the flaps and suture to the under overlying orbicularis. I am escaping the proper method because everyone, everywhere you will get it. And the wound closure is once flaps are secured, the orbicularis is sutured back to 606 of vicryl and followed a skin with 60 cell in the 60 cell. And uh, the second with the tips for the hemostasis, good preoperative assessment to rule out bleeding diastasis, preoperative blood pressure assessment, use of adrenaline along with local anesthetic pro provided there is no medical coordination, contraindication, good nasal packing is, is the, the good nasal packing right in the beginning if bleeding is anticipated, raising the head end of the table, avoid known blood vessels, generally if major uh, blood vessel is cut, uh, chances of more around bleeding and in, in initial phase it is very horrified for the doctor. And um, well, well powered suction, judicious use of pottery, keep material like gel foam or bone wax in the armamentarium. You can use mitomycin and intubation at, 
and injective measures and uh, useful surgical tips are ensure good anesthesia and hemostasis. After the initial incision, raise the skin flap and work between orbicularis and skin to avoid damaging the angular vein. Orbicularis fibers can be divided with blunt dissection using cotton buds. Avoid orbicular suture to avoid an unsightly scar. Orbicularis suture should not be cut. A, a back cut towards or upper, upper eyelid can be made perpendicular to the upper edge of the incision when the patient skin is thin and prone to tearing. An adequate bony ostium is essential to ensure long-term success. And the take-home message for today is, for a skin incision, trace anterior lacrimal crest by palpating upward from inferior orbital to orbital margin, restrict bone window to area between anterior and posterior lacrimal crest to avoid entering paranasal sinuses, separate the orbicular circuli and never cut them, otherwise unsightly a scar. Avoid injury angular vein by making a skin incision on anterior lacrimal crest. If, ang if angular vein is cut, it is certain that your operating time is going to be double and triple. Thank you. Thank you, professors, listening. Well, now Thank we you. know what not to do. That is must Im most important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi, sir. Now we have Dr. Hemanti Chaudhary, who is consultant of ophthalmologist in Chaudhary High Hospital and Research Center, Silchar Assam. She is also the chief editor of Journal of Ophthalmic Research and Practice, and her topic is intravitreal injection procedure and precautions. Good afternoon all. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Deepak Mishra for making me part of this very interesting IC learning from our mistake. And my topic is intravitreal injection procedures and precautions. I do not have any financial interest in this presentation. So when we talk about intravitreal injections, the first thing that our, comes to our mind is anti-VEGF. But I will also touch upon a little bit of intravitreal steroid and intravitreal antibiotics, which is a surefire way to treat postoperative endophthalmitis. So why are we having this talk? You must have come across these disturbing uh, headlines, which talk about eyes being lost after injection. Then when we also do literature review, we have cases of cluster endophthalmitis, both from India and abroad, especially after use of intravitreal bebasizumab. So we definitely don't want to land up in a situation like this. And that's why AIOS, our parent body and VRSI, along with AIMS, have come up with this very uh, important guidelines for intravitreal injection, especially Avastin. This was published in 2017 and then has been updated. So I will be mostly focusing my talk on that. So one very important thing is to differentiate between authentic Avastin and a counterfeit product. For reference here, the top one is the authentic product and the bottom figure is showing a counterfeit product. So how do we do that? That is done by checking the Kessler code. So when it comes, of, comes to Avastin or Vivacizumab, we have to procure the drug from an authorized Roche distributor. We have to ensure that cold chain is maintained right from the distributor to the user end. And when it has reached the user, it should be hosp in a hospital, it should be preserved, refrigerated, and documentation should be done, which will save you in future. So what are the prerequisites before you go for the injection? You have to take a informed consent from the patient and this is also the consent form which is given by the VRSI and we are also using that. You have to let the patient know about the off-level status of the drug and then this is just a sample chart where you can show to the patient what are the options that are available to them other than the off-level status. After the consent, the procedure has to be done by a trained ophthalmologist. So when it is talked about preparing bevacizumab, it has to be fractionated and allocated. Allocating has to be done in insulin syringes from that multi-dose vial and then those are preserved in ETO sterilized packages. Packages are again kept in boxes which is then refrigerated. 
Now on the day of injection, what are the screening that you will do? You will have to do a negative regurgitation test. Patients if have any infection, blepharitis, mavomitis, you do not want to do that. On that day, you have to defer it. And bilateral injections are not at all recommended. Sugar, we always check and we want that to be less than 200. So in the pre-op medication, let me directly take you to the OR and do, uh, show you what is our modus operandi. The first video, when the surgeon is taking the medication, there our staff nurse will start putting proparacaine and 5% povidonidine alternately and that will go on for 2-3 times. In the meantime, the surgeon will come, do spirit swab of that eye to be injected. Before taking any medication, the surgeon has to check the box. The surgeon has to check the expiry date. And then we will do and take out the medication. Moving ahead, the box has been checked. And now the top of the vial has to be cleaned with alcohol swab. And then taking out the medication is again different for bevacizumab and different for single use. The right sided video is eccentrics. So eccentrics, there is a dedicated needle with which it has to be taken out. And for bevacizumab, of course, it is uh, aliquoted in syringes as I have already shown. Now, since this is a mistake session, let me also show you a mistake video. The bottom video, left side, is a mistake video where you, you are seeing the patient is sitting in an OPD chair. There is no draping and the surgeon is going for the injection. So in our India, in Indian scenario, this is a mistake. We would definitely not do that because this is not recommended by the VRSI and AIOS guidelines. In contrary, this is the video, the fourth one which is running now, where we are patient preparing the patient with 10% betadine that we would do for any other intraocular surgery. We have to treat injections like any other intraocular surgery, draping and polythene draping all has to be done. Coming to another mistake video, you will note a staff nurse has just injected this lady. But in India, it has to be done by a trained ophthalmologist. Again, our preferred video, our preferred quadrant is inferotemporal, but it can be any quadrant of your choice. After putting 5% povidone iodine, we are marking with the caliper. It will be 3.5 to 4 millimeter, depending on the lentil status. After it has been marked with the caliper, again, one drop of 5% povidone has to come in. Then a brand new 30 gauge needle is used. It is not the needle with which you had taken out the drug certainly and then this has this is plugged with a cotton and then again there is 5% povidone being given. Next again a mistake video you will note here the surgeon has marked the area and then the surgeon is going straight ahead and giving the injection. This is a mistake again because in the guidelines it is mentioned very, very clearly that the last substance that touches the conjunctival cul-de-sac prior to your injection should be 5% povidone iodine. There are no two ways about it. Now the fourth video here is a intravitreal steroid injection, Ozordex. So the bore of the needle is thicker in contrast to your 30 gauge. So you will note something different is being done here. With the cotton bud, we will displace the conjunctiva and then put the 5% povidone so that there is no egress of vitreous. Moving ahead, we also sometimes do injection with cataract surgery. Here you have seen a cataract surgery is done and you are seeing the lens is in situ. The visco wash has been done. Now again, we will put povidone iodine, mark the area, give the injection and there is one extra step that is being done here and that is the reason why I am showing you this video. After the injection is done, we just have to tap the cornea a little bit to know if the eye is too hard. If you find the eye is too hard, you just have to let some aqueous or BSS out from the side port. Moving ahead to our last video, this is a trolley which is used for intravitreal antibiotic preparations. Now, for intervitreal antibiotics, commonly what we are using is for gram-positive vancomycin, 1 mg per 0.1 ml, and for gram-negative, ceftazidim, 2.25 mg. So, this is 
the making from 500 mg vancomycin but also vancomycin is available as 250 mg here it is you you are seeing 500 mg vancomycin being mixed so now 10 ml sterile water has been inserted inside and then only 0.2 ml of the solution will be drawn here what i'd like to emphasize is each time that you are taking the sterile water you will have to use a new needle why because some amount of drug is present in the hub of the needle and this can change the concentration. So to have an accurate concentration, you will have to keep on changing the needle. Now this is again another rotatory movement that you have seen in the video and we let the air pass from down to up and again vice versa so that the mixing of the drug is done properly and after we have achieved the requisite concentration, we will again mark it and then move ahead and do the preparation of another drug. So what is the post-op management? Recommendation is you have to see the patient within the first three days. In our setup, we see the patient on the first post-injection day. And that day you have to check for the IOP and slit lamp evaluation has to be done. If there is any IOP uh, increase, we have to manage that. So what are the five mantras to avoid infection in injection? Those would be perform the procedure in OR, be like a surgeon using all mask, cap and any, think it to be your cataract surgery and just go and do injection and iodine prep, draping and speculum must be put. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you Dr. Chaudhary for a very inside talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Lippi Chakravarti. He is HOD at CCM Government Medical College, Durg. Also runs an independent eye care center, Lipika Netradham at Chhattisgarh. Been glaucoma consultant and done glaucoma fellowship from Arvind Eye Hospital and PG Institute, Madurai. Dr. Lippi. Yeah, good afternoon all. So it's already 12. I will try to rush through my presentation. And the topic is trabeculectomy procedure and precautions no financial disclosures, principles of trabeculectomy surgery. This was introduced by Dr. Kanz, as most of us know, in 1968. What this surgery does is it channels aqueous flow into episcleral venous network through a patent sclerostomy under a partial thickness scleral flap. There are sutures fixed or releasable to control aqueous flow, antimetabolites like MMC or 5-FU to reduce the scarring and there are some miscellaneous steps to this trabeculectomy surgery. Let's go through the steps fast. So step one is taking the brittle suture, the superior rectus suture instead of this corneal traction suture can be taken. It is preferred also by many glaucometologists. Conjunctival dissection. There should be a complete dissection. Fibrous tissue should be nicely excised. Posteriorly also we need to go uh, so that uh, the posterior conjunctiva like in SICS, posterior conjunctiva here is excised thoroughly. Then a step three is a gentle cautery. So not much to it. This is a gentle cautery being done. Scleral flap measurement. The measurement taken is around 4 by 4 or 3.5 by 3.5. It depends upon the surgeon's ease and experience, whether we are planning a combined or a trab alone. Next we have, after measuring the scleral flap, we need to take the groove. This is done with 11 number blade or any blade the surgeon is comfortable with, rectangle or triangular flap. Triangular flap, the tip is to be raised uniformly, nicely, a clean cut raising of the tip of the triangle is to be done. MMC application in the form of MMC soaked sponges, 0 0.02 or 0 0.04 milligram per milliliter concentration, it varies as per the case. Injection MMC can also be done, that will be shown in uh, a successive video. Then we are lifting the scleral flap. So this has to be again a very clean lifting with the same 11 number blade. And as we approach the limbus, this 11 number blade can be replaced with a scleral crescent. So this is what I do. This I have learned at Coimbatore, Arvindai Hospital Coimbatore. These are Dr. Satyan sir's video actually. We have learned our trabeculectomy seeing his videos. So I am maintaining that. 
this is a site port site port is ha it has to be taken in combined surgery like this is a combined surgery we are planning and in trab alone also we need to have a site port so that at the end of trab we can form the ac nicely and we can see the aqueous outflow that is there to the bleb or not these are essentially the cataract steps this is hydro dissection and uh, fecoing of the cataract will be done then this is pc wash with iol implantation yeah so this is that feco probe is going it's doing all the fecoing part the main uh, trab steps which we need to go through are trabeculectomy pbi peripheral basal aridectomy and viscoelastic wash so this is how the punching is done it can be done with the Kelly's Desmet punch or sometimes Vanna Caesar is used. Uh, the Kelly's Desmet punch size is uh, 50 micron or it is 1 millimeter. When the ostia is punched, then we should have that in mind that on either side of the ostia, about 0.5 millimeter gap is left. So you can see that the ostia is here and 0.5 millimeter gap on either side of the flap is left. This is the aridectomy done and this is the releasable suture i do it this way this is a step one cornea to cornea step two is from cornea to the scleral flap and step three will be from the flap to the sclera so these are the three steps and after doing this we need to tie the four knots circle it four times so this is one two three and then four yeah, and we do not need to lock it here. We just need to leave it as such. Then a step three will be conjunctival closure. This can be done in a continuous way or interrupted. Interrupted when we take, then we need to take tenon to the conjunctiva first. And then conjunctiva to conjunctiva can be done. Two or three bites can be taken. Um, and when we oppose this conjunctiva, it should fall on the cornea. So it should sit there as a ridge. It should not be like in SICS that we are not touching the cornea when we are opposing the conjunctival flap. But in this trabeculectomy, you can see that sort of ridge which is forming. It is sitting on the cornea. So this, this ridge, this belt that should be there, this takes uh, care of the trabeculectomy, the posterior aqueous outflow. This is an easy step. The last step, AC reformation, checking for leak. Then NC, SC antibiotics and steroids, this is optional. This is uh, trimming of that releasable suture it is cut flush with the cornea there are other methods of taking releasable sutures this was that mmc which i was mentioning subtenon injection of mmc that can be done about seven to eight millimeter from limbus or vexel sponge is used to distribute this mmc and also to prevent mitomycin c from going towards the limbus deep scleral incision that can sometimes happen so there are some oops moments in trabeculectomy in this we have uh, a deep scleral incision being taken here. The incision should be around uh, a half of a sclera. So here we can see that it's very deep and the flap is being raised along with that. There is a choroid show. This should not be done. Ideally, this should be sutured and a different side trabeculectomy can be planned. Then this is bleed during aridectomy, common in those who are into antiplatelets and uh, other similar drugs. So we need to take care of that P BT, PT, CT and all. This all creates a mess. We need to wash this with Simco and then uh, put air bubble. Positive sedals test. This can be seen if the conjunctival closure is not proper, if the flap is not properly taken. So this all uh, can happen. There's a big leak. The dye is flowing. So we need to put a BCL or suture. Opposite to this, leak we have cases of bleph failure there are varied causes to bleph failure and fibrosis and bleph failure which is more common than the leaking bleph we need to recognize failure identify the cause and then treat the iop rising iop and trying to try to restore the bleph function these are the varied types of bleph we can get after trabeculectomy because Fibrosing bleb or failure of bleb is more common. Digital massage is something which our young postgraduates and comprehensive ophthalmologists should know of. Patients can also do this. Releasable suture, again, this has to be in the armamentarium of comprehensive ophthalmologists also when they are doing a trap. So uh, the apical releasable suture is released here. The bleb was almost flat and there is no digital massage being done with a single blink of the eye only. The bleb has started forming. It is rising nicely and it is occupying almost half of the eye. So this is the beauty of releasable suture. 
So at the end, I would like to conclude that what seems to be tip of the, uh, what seems to be an iceberg, it is actually many a time only the tip of the iceberg. So trabeculectomy as such is a simple surgery, but there are many other issues involved in it which can be dealt with experience. Thank you AIOC for giving me this opportunity and thank you our Chief Instructor Dr. Deepak Mishra for having me in the IC. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Lippi for showing us all the tips with the live videos. It, it was just like a live surgery. If So all our topics has finished. If anyone have any questions, please we are answer. Okay. Thank you all of you for attending the IC in a huge number. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.